of the service and yes. the tributes to the mothers. I could give one to mine, but time is running out, so we'll do what we can to give tribute to the Lord himself. Yes. Today being Mother's Day, the title of our message today is called The Personification of Motherhood. The Personification. Anybody know what that great big word means? Personification. You know, the, the children or the young people that were up here a few moments ago were asked to describe their mothers. They were personifying what a mother is. So today we're going to get the personification. I have two mothers in mind, scripturally, that we're going to deal with. One is not one that most of you have probably ever heard the name of, but she has a prominent place in scripture. The other one was actually named earlier, uh, and we'll get to that one secondly. So we're going to ask you to go to first, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. I'm going to read the first six verses, and then I'm going to share some background of this story. So that's 2 Samuel chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Now I'm going to pause there for a moment, and just to bring up the history behind this, when Joshua and the Israelites crossed the, Red, uh, the Jordan River, and they conquered Jericho, and then they went on to a place called Ai. And... Um, they did a bad thing there in that they didn't slay them. And long story short, there were some Gibeonites thereafter who came over to them. They heard about how, how aggressive they were and how powerful they were. And they didn't want to have to face them, so they disguised themselves. They came to Joshua, made out like they were from way, long, far away. Come to find out they were their neighbors. So Joshua made a league with them that they wouldn't trouble them, and then he found out that they weren't who he thought they were. But he still honored his pact, if you will, with them. And so the Israelites were never, they made them pay tribute, but they were never to destroy the Gibeonites. When Saul became king, he sought to destroy them, thus breaking the uh, contract, if you will. So now Saul is dead, David is king, and God, because of what Saul had done, saw fit to let a famine come upon the land. When David inquired why this famine, why, Lord, are you allowing that, he said it's because of what Saul has done. And until this thing is rectified, there will be famine in the land. All right, so um, he said it's because of his bloody house, that of Saul. He was not to have killed him, and he did what he could to exterminate them. So now the Gibeonites are out for revenge. Verse 3, Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul. They despised Saul, they didn't want anything he had. Nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, what ye shall say, what will I do for you? So whatever you want me to do, we'll do it. And here was their answer, verse 5. And they, answered, then, and they answered the king, the man that consumed us 
and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. All right, so can you get the picture? Mm -hmm. David says, what do you want as retribution for all the carnage that Saul broke our covenant with and did? They said, I don't want anything. We don't want his silver. We don't want his gold. We don't even want the Israelites to suffer death because of us. Give us seven of Saul's sons. We will hang them up and we, that will suffice. That will uh, pay the debt as it were. The king had spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, verse 7, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah. This is the mother we're going to talk about. R-I-Z-P-A-H. Rizpah. Some of you maybe have never paid attention who she is, but she's very a very remarkable woman. He took her, the, her two sons whom she bare unto Saul, and, and they took five more other sons of Saul. Verse 9, And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days of the beginning of barley harvest. Keep in mind, a famine has come on the land because Saul broke the covenant with the Gibeonites. So God's judgment for Saul's bloody uh, house is now upon the Israelites. There's a curse here, as it were. And David sought to make it right. Just give us seven sons of Saul, and we're going to hang them up. We're going to string them up and let them die, and we'll be satisfied. It is a sad thing that innocent people suffer for the sins of their rulers. It's going on even now. It's so sad. But it's been like that forever. And so this, because of Saul's thirst, uh, or rather this was because of their thirst for revenge from Saul. It was uh, not meant to obey, uh, appease God's wrath. God's wrath was not in this. It was the giving ice wrath and God let it be so. All right, so verse number nine, he delivered them into the giving hands. They hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and all seven of them together, presumably on different trees, they were all hanging, and they fell all in one day. Now, verse number 10. And Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth. Now, uh, Rizpah was a concubine of Saul's. And so Saul fathered or sired her children. She has two sons here that were caught up in this revenge or this retribution, however you want to call it, and her two sons were hanged, well, along with the other five. And we're going to read here what she did. It's in the beginning of the barley, barley harvest now, and famine is in the land. No rain is falling. Verse 10 Rizpah took the daughter, I'm sorry, Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth, and this, of course, sackcloth is always a symbol of mourning and sorrow, etc., and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven, and suffered or did not allow neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. She was there to protect her dead son's bodies. This is a personification of a mother. This demonstrates more than almost anything I can imagine the heart of a mother and how she was so broken because those were her sons. She birthed those sons. She raised those. She loved her sons. And to see them become victimized because of the man who fathered her children, I'm sure, was a, an extremely difficult thing for her. Now, the word Rizpah means a hot or baking stone. A hot or baking stone. And this woman exhibited white hot passion in protecting her murdered sons. 
The Gibeonites' revenge broke her motherly heart. But even though her sons were dead, she would not allow the buzzards and the fowls of the air to come and pick their bodies clean. And at night, when the predators would come around, how she did it, I really don't know. But she protected them perhaps from the cats that climbed the tree and would have come over and tried to devour her sons. Even though they were not living, her motherly heart did the very best she could to protect them from all the vultures and all of the predators and so forth. And that reminds me of the scripture in, Sol in the Song of Solomon that says, love is strong as death. Even though they were dead, they were still her sons. And she was still determined to do the very best she could. So here, during the barley harvest, here are seven blood-covered bodies hanging on trees and one mother to protect them all. So verse number 10 says, she took sackcloth, she spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest. Now this is not a few hours or a couple of days. From the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told David what she had done, the concubine uh, of, uh, of Saul. Now, this mother had no power, no influence to prevent the gruesome murder of her sons. Right. There was no way she could have prevented that. She had no power, even though she was a concubine of Saul. But there was no one that could stay her hand from protecting them from the dangers of, and, and showing acts of mercy for their mangled corpses. Mm -hmm. I don't know a mother today that would have done such a thing. She watched those broken, bleeding uh, bodies, watched as day and night went by, as their bodies blackened, as their bodies decayed, as their bodies withered away, and she never relaxed her vigil, never. How she did that 24-7, only God knows. She had to catch cat naps. How she ate, how her, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say all of that. Lord. But I'll guarantee you it came at a great sacrifice. Lord. I'll guarantee you that that was a love deeper than anything that I know about. Lord. And she, I can imagine she was exhausted from a 24-7 watch. Right. But no matter how tired she may have gotten, the love of motherhood kicked in in such a way that she refused to watch those sons be devoured by the beasts and the fowls afterwards. So leaving them there, if she had left them there, um, and how do I want to say this? The law in that day said that anyone that hanged on a tree had to be buried by nightfall. So according to the law, they would have had to have been buried the first day after, um, the day of rather, their murder. They might have been hanged in the morning, but by sunset they were supposed to have been buried. That was what the law said. But things are different here because the law was already broken by Saul, and so um, leaving them there really speaks for the vengeance of man, the vengeance of the Gibeonites in this case, because of the fact that the law required them to be buried by sunset. So she wrestled through hot days. Remember, there, this is already a barren country, and there's famine in the land, which means there's no rainfall. It's hot, it's dry, it's miserable, the sun beating down on her head, and no doubt there were anxious nights with uh, the foul stench of their rotting bodies and the beast of night that would come. And here they are, the stench of all of this, and she has to smell this. But the love that she had is indescribable. Mm. And she refused to leave her watch. Mm. She refused mm. to leave her watch. 
And she stayed there until the rains came. Now at a certain point, God's vengeance, this was vengeance from God too, allowing it to happen because Saul should never have done what he did. And so now they're having to pay a price. Well, eventually in verse 11, it was told to David what Rizpah was doing, what was happening. And so David went in verse 12 and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of so on and so forth, brought them up from thence, and he took the bones of Saul and Jonathan and her, part of that same family, he allowed them to be buried in their family burying grounds. David was willing to do that much. He heard of her motherly devotion. He heard of her long vigil. And that was very unique, very unusual, unprecedented, but that was a mother. Those were her sons. She birthed those sons. She raised those sons. She loved those sons. And her desire, Rizba's desire for a proper respect for her dead was realized. David was impressed. The Bible doesn't give all the details of that, but imagine the king hearing about a woman that refuses to leave her hanging sons for the vultures and all the rest, no matter what danger it put her in. When did she sleep? I don't know. When did she rest? I don't know. When did, and how did she eat and drink? I don't know. The Bible doesn't give those details. The details are that this mother was going to protect her dead, which was done out of revenge, uh, and she was not going to let, it's bad enough that they got murdered, but then to see them eaten by beasts and fowls, that was too much for her. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. That is the personification of motherhood. And I think about the culture in which we're living. Very, very different. Sometimes we wonder how many mothers are left in this world, truly mothers. And it takes more than birthing a child to be a mother. Plenty of them have abandoned them, thrown them in dumpsters, tried to flush them down toilets, mm -hmm. left them at the door of a hospital, um, butchered them up, buried them, whatever, whatever. All kinds of issues. But this was a real mother. Amen. This was a genuine mother. May God help us in our day. Amen. All right, now we're going to move on to the 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is the mother that was discussed a little earlier and the one that I have chosen to use uh, from a different angle, but yet it personifies motherhood, and it, this one will be Hannah. Um, now, I'm going to read the first eight verses. We're going to try to hasten through because the time is slipping away. First Samuel chapter 1, I'm going to read the eight, first eight verses, and then we'll take it from there. Now, there was a certain man of Ramath M. Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. Key point, keep that in your mind. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. Mm -hmm. So this wife has a lot of children, sons and daughters, and the husband, being a dutiful husband, he gives portions to all of those. But, verse 5, mm -hmm. unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Now this is problem number one. We'll come back to that. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. And therefore she wept and did not eat. That is, Peninnah provoked Hannah and Hannah wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better than thee than ten sons? This is where I would say men don't always understand. <laughs> but that's okay. That's not, the, that's not the thrust of the message. All right. So here we have a husband with two wives. Problem number one, 
two wives. Every husband should have one at a time until that one dies. All right? Number Problem number two is that Hannah was the most favored of the two wives, mm -hmm. and she had no children. Mm. <coughs> Problem number three is that Panetta was jealous of Elkanah's affection toward Hannah, of the, aware that he's giving her a, a more worthy portion because his love for her is greater. That's a real problem, mm -hmm. a real problem. And Panetta, the, the, the wife that has the children, is jealous and she has a very ugly disposition. Mm -hmm. Now you put all of that in one household, you've got a problem. Oh, you've got a bunch of problems. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and I'm this right. is what happened because in that problem number four is that it created discord in the house. Right. Right. It created discord. If there's anything more egregious than having a home, it's ha uh, with, um, well, number one, with two wives, it's having a home where there's disharmony mm -hmm. and discord. And we know that there's plenty of that in our day, even with one husband and one wife. Forget about whose fault it might be. Harmony should be in the home. Home should be our haven. Mm -hmm. And many times it isn't. Mm -hmm. So now, here we see a situation. Now, the husband can't understand why Hannah is so hurt and upset because he's giving her so much, mm -hmm. but he's not giving her what she really wants. Mm -hmm. She wants to be a mother. Mm -hmm. She wants a child. She wants to be able to embrace her own yes. and yes. not watch somebody else have them, and she can't. Right. And their money cannot buy a child. Yes. Uh, uh, even favor cannot, cannot replace what God innately placed in the heart of a woman. A desire to be a mother and that was her desire and all of this that we see today of people that's unnatural for women to despise their children right. it's unnatural for them to want to do away with their children something has gone awry right. and it's being passed down from one generation to the next many have not seen good examples before them they don't know how to be a mother right. they don't know how to appreciate motherhood My they don't God. they don't have never perhaps felt wanted by a mother. They don't know what experiencing the love of a mother is. So therefore, they don't know how to express it to children. It's sad. We're in a messed up world. Oh, yeah. my God. Have so mercy. here is Hannah, lovely woman, loves the Lord. She goes with her husband yearly when they go to Shiloh to worship the Lord and offer sacrifices and so on and so forth. And after that, then, you know, Elkanah passes out all the wealth and distributes you to both, but that's not taking the place of what she wants. Her heart yearns for a baby, mm. a son, in fact. My God, yes. So how did she respond mm. when the when the, her adversary, being Panetta, she's rubbing it in mm. and making fun of her, and probably sinu insinuating or flat out telling her you're not worthy and something's wrong with you, and and you shouldn't be here, and who knows what. But the thing that's striking about Hannah is she never retaliated. Mm -hmm. She simply wept. Yes, she fretted, but she took it to God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Most Amen. women would not do that. There would be World War III in the house. <laughs> but she didn't do that. My Lord. She My didn't God. try to retaliate to Panetta. She simply brought her burdens to God. My Amen. Lord. My God. Oh, Father. Mm -hmm. Now, let me read verse 6 and 7 again. And her adversary provoked her sore. Mm -hmm. You can only imagine. She's rubbing it in. Now, I think part of the problem is that Elkanah doesn't know how to divide his love between two women. Now, that would be a tough task. Mm -hmm. And Panenna is not his favorite. And she knows he's not her favorite. So that adds insult to injury. Mm -hmm. And that fuels her fire. Mm -hmm. All right? So her adversary provoked her, Hannah, sore. For to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. My Lord. And as he did so, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Every year they went up there together as a family, she provoked her. She provoked her. Therefore, she wept and lost her appetite. Didn't even want to eat. Mm -hmm. could, Elkanah could not understand it, but he's a man. Mm -hmm. He's not going to understand the heart of a woman and the heart of a, desire, a, a woman who wants to be a mother. Mm -hmm. So... 
I'm going to skip over a little bit of this, but Hannah decided, I'm going to rise up, I'm going to go to the temple, and I'm going to pray. I am bringing this thing. God knows I want to be a mother. I have the husband. He shut up my womb. Lord, would you please give me a child? Now, it would be no easy task to live for years with a nasty, hateful, spiteful panina. That would not be easy. And so, evermore, she wept and she did not eat. It just took her appetite. She was so, if I can use the word consumed, with her desire to be a mother mm -hmm. and to embrace her own son mm -hmm. and not help care for her adversary's children. Whether she did or not, I don't know. But it's striking how Hannah retained the serenity of her soul in the midst of all of this. And as it were, she was a veritable lily among the thorns. She did not respond in kind to her adversary. I mean, they could have gone at it like cats. I mean, you know what I mean. I mean, she could have, they could have come to blows even. But that wasn't her disposition. She just simply took it to God. She did not respond in kind to her adversary. Hannah had a house, but she did not have a home. And so even her husband could not comfort her. But that's born in a woman. God designed women. For such things. Granted, not everybody has it, but nonetheless, that's peculiar to womanhood, yeah. to be a mother. She longed for a son of her own. She wanted to love and she wanted to nurture. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be a mother. Mm -hmm. So I would suspect that every time Penina had another child, looks like she had several, that she rubbed it in, she uh, flaunted it before Hannah. And so the battle no doubt got more intense as the years passed. Mm. And, and, and that barrenness that Hannah had was, was because, that burden that she had was because of Panetta's heartlessness and her jealousy. And, but the thing that's so striking is that Hannah was never guilty of unwomanly retaliatory conduct. Mm -hmm. Lord. She just prayed. And this day looks like it's coming to a culmination. Lord, it's almost like giving a child or I die. Mm. And so she's a woman of sorrowful spirit. She wept, she fretted, but prayer was her uh, refuge. Prayer was her refuge. Mm. Now the word Hannah means gracious mm. or graciousness. And she definitely lived up to that reputation. Yeah. She was very gracious. Mm -hmm. She didn't try to uh, uh, do the other one in. She was childless, but she was not prayerless. All right, so let's start now at verse number nine. Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post in the temple of the temple of the Lord. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Now it was of such. Now listen to, listen to what she's telling the Lord in verse 11. Mm -hmm. And she vowed a vow. Mm -hmm. Now, this, is, now this, this vow she's about to vow is serious. She wants a son so badly. Listen to what she says. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. Now she didn't say a child, she said a man child. I'm, I'm getting specific here. I want a boy. I want a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, My God. and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, what kind of vow is this? What she's saying, if you will give me a child, I will in turn give him back to you. My God, help me. Now, what sense does that make? I want him with me as long as I can keep him. I want to raise him and nurture him, and I want him in my house. But, Lord, I want one so badly. That if you will give me one, if you will, um, if you will assuage this uh, yearning in my heart to be a mother, a nurturer, I'll give him back to you mm -hmm. all the days of his life. My Lord, oh man, now, that's a strong vow. Yeah. <laughs> that is a very strong vow. Yes, it is. My God. And you know what? Mm -hmm. God heard that prayer. Amen. Mm -hmm. And God gave her a son, mm -hmm. just like she asked. 
despite all the bitterness. Let's drop down to verse number 20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son mm -hmm. and called his name Samuel, mm -hmm. saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Mm -hmm. This child was a direct answer to prayer. Mm -hmm. A direct answer to prayer. Mm -hmm. And he was born. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to read quickly down through the rest of the chapter. But Hannah went not up. Well, Elkanah and his house, you know, they go up to the offer of the Lord every year, these sacrifices. But Hannah knew she had a vow to keep. My God, yes. And that was, I want to keep him with me just as long as I can. Because in time, I'm going to have to relinquish him to the service of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So uh, this time, she said, she went not up, verse 22. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. My Lord. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until you've weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until he, she weaned him. Now in those days, weaning might be three years of age, anywhere between three and five. It's not like six months, nine months nowadays. It was for years. <laughs> And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. They slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. My Lord, my she God. spent as much time with him, but she knew God was so good to me to give me a son, I've got to keep my end of the bargain. Yes. I've got to keep my vow. Yes. And she paid that vow yes. at a very great sacrifice. My Lord, yes, be did. careful what you promise the Lord. He's expecting you to deliver on it. Yeah. It might come at a great sacrifice, but she did not flinch. God gave me this son. I made what some would think was a harsh vow, mm. but I'm going to keep my vow. Mm. I promised he was gracious to do this, and I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So she paid that vow and relinquished that child to the service of God. Mm. Now, in the next chapter, I would like to read it all, but I know we're running close here on time. This produced a song that she has written. I would call it the Psalm of Hannah. And this psalm, these first 10 verses in chapter 21, maybe we'll quickly go through them. It recounts all of what she went through and how the Lord ultimately delivered her, the battles and the struggles and all of the things that she had to fight against. Mm -hmm. But Hannah's song, let's read it real quickly. Two and one. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Remember who the enemy was. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. Fortunately, she didn't try to get revenge. She didn't get spiteful. She simply turned to the Lord, and the Lord avenged her of her adversary in a much better way than she would ever have been able to. Right. There is none holy beside thee. There is neither any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they have stumbled, and, are, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she that hath many children is waxed feeble. Can you get the correlation here between herself and Penina? The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he lifts up. Now he brought her very low. She came very low to despair, but he lifted her up. Yeah, yeah. He raises up the poor out of the dust, lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. 
Out of heaven shall be, he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. I'm telling you this day, this woman, this mother, this wife was happy. She was rejoicing. She had risen above her enemies, and now God has repaid her, and she is singing a song of praise, a song of victory. My God, yes. We all know that Samuel grew up to become a very famous man of God. He became a priest, he was a prophet, and he was a judge from those humble beginnings. God used him in a mighty way. Yes, he, did. he anointed Saul as king. He, he prophesied Saul's downfall. He was a man that was close to God. He had a relationship with the Lord, and he judged Israel. He prophesied Saul's demise. He anointed David king as uh, king of Israel, and he was his counselor for as long as he lived. So God blessed Hunt, and, and to top it all off, God, because I, I think, this is just me, scripture don't say it, but I believe that because of this tremendous sacrifice that Hannah made for God by giving up Samuel, God in return blessed her with three more sons and two daughters. And that, I'm sure, kind of helped to ease some of the pain of missing her firstborn. Right, God right. was so gracious. Amen. God is good. Amen. God is good. Oh, no. Amen. God so is. good. Amen. I mean, that woman got a hold of God. It was as it were she was holding on to his ankles. And Lord, I want a son, and I'll tell you what. You give me a son, and I will give him back to you. And that was a great sacrifice for her. Yes. She kept them as long as she could. And then, as Brother David mentioned earlier, once a year after she turned him over to God, put him in Eli's control, every year she brought him a new coat. She came up to see him, and however many days they stayed there, she relished the thought. She embraced them. Who knows what all they did. Spent as much time with him, I'm sure, as she could have. But now he's rising up in, under the tutelage of Eli to learn what it means to be priests and how, what it means to communicate with God. As a very young child, God spoke to him. Very small child. He did not even recognize the voice he of God. He didn't recognize it. And he came God. to Eli. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. I didn't say anything. Go back to bed. That happened about three times. Mm -hmm. And when God made himself known to Samuel, he established a real relationship with God thereafter. Amen. <laughs> Amazing God. story. Amen. But this woman was a mother indeed. Mm -hmm. A mother indeed. Amen. When I think of that and I look at the great contrast between that culture and ours. And right now, our country is in the thralls of Roe v. Wade. Will it get overturned? There are those people who are marching at, um, on the, at the White House, I suppose, marching at special churches that they've targeted, that they, know, that they are aware that want to save life and not destroy it, doing their very best they can that this doesn't happen, what has happened to the heart of our nation? Where are the mothers to decry all of these abortions? Yes, yes, yes. And uh, people want to kill, but they don't want to bring life for, the, so, for so many. Child abuse, selfish women, women that don't know how to be mothers, and yet they're birthing children, mm -hmm. don't know how to be mothers. All they want is the pleasure, but they don't want responsibility, and they don't even know how because they didn't have a mother. It's just gotten worse from one generation to the next. There's almost, in this culture, there's almost little or no motherly instinct anymore. It's so sad. So sad. Children are dispensable. Just, uh, they're a hindrance to me. They're a problem. To me, they hinder my style, they hinder what I have in mind, they hinder my career, they hinder this. It's been going on from the 70s. I remember it as a young woman. You know, your career is more important than having children. Put them, let them be latchkey kids. Send them to the daycare. Sit them in front of a television. Let them raise themselves. You have, a, you, you deserve your own career. And look where it's brought us. Motherhood has been degraded. Motherhood has been made less than noble. Less than what it is. My God. Oh, Just throw away the children, but I'm here to tell you that children are precious. Amen. Yes. Children Amen. are precious. Yes. 
Some days ago, I happened to be in the home of a family that I've met for the first time. I don't know, it was over a week ago. And um, lovely husband and wife. I mean, I was so impressed. And they have, I think, four children and another on the way. That is so rare now. People want to decide that I'm only going to have this many. But they loved their children. It was obvious. Their home was very well kept. And um, the children they had sent away that evening for, to their grandmother's house so they wouldn't disrupt the business that we were taking care of. But one child was still, still there. And as we were going through what we were doing, I happened to look up, and there's this little boy with tiptoeing up the steps. Cute little guy. <laughs> I waved at him, and he waved at me, and they turned around and, and looked, and he was so cute. I said, how old is he? Six? And I, I said, I, I told him later, I said, I wish I could meet all your children. A lovely husband and wife. They've been married about 14 years, and, the, and I could tell that they cared about each other. In fact, the husband said, we are happily married. We don't say that hardly anymore. That's right, that's right. We are happily been I asked him, how long have you been married? And they told me, I think they said 14 or 15 years, and he said, happily, he, he emphasized that. We're happily married. I was so glad. So I was so proud of them, and I didn't even know. <laughs> But it was, it was a blessing. And I, I, I love children. I wish we had more here. And they're precious. They are. They're jewels. But they need mothers. Amen. May God help us. We appreciate the ones we have. Yeah. We appreciate the parents that birthed them and are raising them to serve the Lord. We don't want to take them for granted. They did a good job this morning. That little lady back there on Sister Faith's knee is as cute as she can be. <laughs> And all the others that come from time to time. But all of them need godly mothers. So those of you who are trying to mother, maybe as grandmothers, do a good job. There's a lot of grandmothers today who are mothering because the mothers forsook them. In some cases, their mothers deceased. In some cases, all kind of issues have occurred. But motherhood is a worthy calling. It's not to be disdained. It's not to be denigrated or criticized. It's not to be minimized as, oh, well, what, what are you? What do you do? I'm a stay-at-home mom. Oh, is that all? Oh, come on now. You're, you're training people to become politicians and presidents and, and corporate executives and whatever. And whatever foundation they get at home is going to influence what they become in the future. Lord, so may God help us. Don't disdain your call, mothers, grandmothers. It's a worthy one. Lord. It's a worthy one. It's a sacrifice. It's hard. You don't always know the answers, and that's why you got to go to God, just like, just like this lady did, just like Hannah did. Take it to the Lord. Lord, you see. She wept. She cried. She poured her heart out and told God, made a vow. I mean, not to us, we would call that a rash vow. You give him to me and I'll give him back. Well, what's the need to get one if you're going to give him back? No, but it, it turned out that he turned out to be a very mighty man of God. Yes, he did. But he had a praying mother, and that made all the difference. So happy day to all the mothers today. Amen. And Thank uh, the Lord. enjoy whatever honor you get today. A lot of mothers don't get any kind of thank you or anything else. If, if your mom is a good mom, tell her thank you once in a while. Let her know it. We'll get to the dads next month. <laughs> so may the Lord help us. Help us, Lord. My God. All right, let us stand. Amen. Thank God for a good day. Appreciate the program and yes. the presentation. Good Amen. songs. Amen. Good recitations and good quiz. <laughs> Lord, help us. Go ahead, Sister Mary. Uh, real quick, I want to give God thanks for uh, giving us guidance. Um, last week, Sunday, um, my job had some issues and they 